The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 14254 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for today. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 14254. Formally moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 14254 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on future prosperity for the North Sea. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Fergus Ewing. Ten minutes, Minister. Presiding officer, last week I attended the Offshore Europe Conference. My reflection from that event is a shared determination within the industry to collaborate and overcome the current challenges made more difficult by the low oil price. Not that this should compromise safety. As Lord Cullen remarked in his speech to the Piper 25 conference in 2013, the industry must never forget to be afraid. However, the Oil & Gas UK Economic Report suggests industry efforts are now starting to bear fruit. First, costs are decreasing with a 22% reduction in the cost of operating existing assets expected by end 2016. Secondly, annual production is expected to rise for the first time in 15 years. In my engagement with the industry, I'm encouraged by some of the great work that is going on. For example, I've met the new Chief Executive of Statoil to discuss the Mariner project, Philippe Guise of Total to discuss Lagan and Tormor, and Maersk to learn about their Kaline project, as well as Trevor Garlick of BP, who are taking forward both Clare and ETAP. However, Presiding Officer, job losses remain a huge concern. The First Minister took decisive action on this by setting up the Energy Jobs Task Force. The task force will be publishing their latest updated report shortly, but I want to share some of the action taken so far. It is engaged with over 1,700 individuals and over 100 employers to help those affected move into new employment, new ventures or training. Much of this support, including one-to-one -one redundancy support for 1,300 people, has been delivered through the PACE programme. The task force has also considered structural challenges, making cost efficiency a priority and looking at best practice from other sectors, as well as considering challenges around leadership. This has led to initiatives that will lay the foundations for improvements across a wide range of action areas. Examples include a groundbreaking cross-sector workshop attended by more than 70 industry leaders in Aberdeen in May, and, read, and led by BP's Trevor Garlick and Andy Samuel, Chief Executive of the Oil and Gas Authority. Five business events over the last six months in Aberdeen for over 200 delegates covering topics such as financial resilience and leadership through change. A business startup programme with 13 new businesses in the North East. I'm grateful to Dr. Lena Wilson and her team for the work they have undertaken, which has made a significant difference. But further action is required. The Oil and Gas Authority has an important role to play in improving stewardship of the North Sea. I met Andy Samuel again last week and he gave me an update in progress. I support the work Andy Samuel and his team are doing at the OGA and reaffirm our commitment to playing a constructive part. I am pleased that they have accepted the principle of total value added in their work which the Scottish Government put forward last year. The OGA has made protecting critical infrastructure and avoiding early decommissioning a priority. It is imperative, presiding officer, that so-called production hubs are not decommissioned prematurely, and I completely agree with this approach. There is still plenty to come from the North Sea. Oil and Gas UK estimates that there could be up to 22,000 million barrels of oil remaining. Statoil's CEO believes that there are opportunities evidenced by their massive investment in the 250 million barrel Mariner project with possibly Bresse to follow. Decommissioning will provide opportunities for our supply chain, but we need to think creatively to maximise opportunities for Scotland whilst at the same time taking all steps to avoid premature cessation of production. 
Critical infrastructure must be protected to stop a domino effect of fields being decommissioned unnecessarily. This means having the right businesses with the right skills and resources to manage late life assets. And this in turn requires the optimum fiscal environment. Whilst we welcome the introduction of a basin-wide investment allowance and reduction in headline rates in the March and July budgets, this was a missed opportunity to commit to the wider fiscal reform needed. To drive further reforms, decisions on fiscal policy should be underpinned by the principle of maximising economic recovery. The Scottish Government has supported the MER strategy from the start, and we argued for that approach indeed long before the UK Government. First, in our oil and gas strategy in 2012, and then in our maximising the returns from oil and gas report in 2013. I believe that decisions on fiscal policy should also be underpinned by the principle of maximising economic recovery. The MER policy will only work if the UK explicitly commit to using their fiscal levers appropriately. Without that, presiding officer, the operators will simply invest elsewhere. I therefore call on the UK Government to consider ways to make this as strong a statutory commitment as possible. There also remain a number of specific reforms that must be addressed with urgency. Ten months ago, the UK Government committed to undertake further work on the fiscal incentives for exploration, infrastructure and late light life assets. We still await a consultation on all of these issues. Discoveries like the OG, the OG UK economic report indicates that only seven exploration wells have been drilled in the first half of this year, a record low. This underlines the urgency of incentivising exploration. I completely agree with Statoil's chief executive, Eldar Setri, who commented two months ago, it's important that the government continue to look at ways to incentivise the industry for exploration because it all starts with exploration. That the UK Government have delayed for 10 months is a failure and shows lack of urgency. We also need the correct policies to ensure that new investment happens. There are a range of exciting discoveries waiting develop, to be developed, uh, such as Rosebank, Bentley and many others. Discoveries like this will require a collaborative approach and the right incentives, but they will also require a stable fiscal environment, not subject to damaging tax rates like in 2011. I would therefore reiterate the call made by the First Minister in June in Aberdeen that it's imperative that the UK Government commits to no tax rises during the lifetime of the UK Parliament and that any significant policy proposals will be consulted upon with industry and the OGA. And finally, Presiding Officer, innovation remains of paramount importance. I've met over 200 innovative companies during the past five years. On Tuesday, just last week, I launched the new Plexus Wellhead solution, which provides a new technological solution for deep water, high temperature drillings. We must continue to harness that excellence and expertise. In conclusion, presiding officer, the oil and gas sector in Scotland has succeeded over the past 40 years and can, with the right policies, continue to succeed over the next 40 years, and the Scottish Government will continue to support it. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we now move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members wish to ask a question or to press the request speak button now. And I call Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. I'm glad the Minister, like me, went to Offshore Europe in Aberdeen last week, and I'm glad that he agreed to make a statement today. I'm disappointed, though, that he had so little to say today about the impact of the oil jobs crisis on the wider Scottish economy. The Energy Jobs Task Force, of course, is very welcome. I'm glad it is to continue its work, but the Minister will recognise that engaging with 1,700 individuals, offering one-to-one -one redundancy support, to 1,300 people touches only the tip of the iceberg when so many more people have already lost their jobs. Oil and Gas UK's economic report last week estimated there are 65,000 fewer people 
in the oil and gas industry and the supply chain compared with the start of last year. A scale of job losses across the UK comparable with the rundown of coal or steel a generation ago. Many thousands of those jobs have been lost in the North East. Many thousands more have been lost in the supply chain across Scotland and thousands more may well be lost in the months to come. Will the Scottish Government therefore now carry out a full assessment of the oil jobs crisis in every constituency and region of Scotland to lay the basis for action to mitigate its economic impact? Will the Scottish Government now take action to help those businesses across the country which are struggling precisely because oil and gas producers are cutting back their costs by £2 billion by the end of next year? And will ministers agree to work with supply chain companies to help them find new markets for their products and services at home and abroad and to protect jobs across Scotland? Minister. Um, well, in response to the questions that Lewis MacDonald raises, um, I, I think it is correct to recognise, first of all, that the work that Dr <coughs> Lena Wilson has been doing in leading the task force uh, has achieved several things. It has helped individuals most directly affected, and I think he's aware of that. I think it's reached out to 16 or 1,700 individuals at the PACE events. I think the best attended PACE events that there have ever been. And I would remind members that the success of PACE, Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, is marked that 72% uh, of people who are made redundant within Scotland find other opportunities, jobs, within six months. Um, as far as the, the general questions is concerned about estimating impact, I mean, we have estimated the impact, and so has Oil & Gas UK, as he has referred to, uh, 6,000 direct job losses, and Oil & Gas UK's estimates of the induced jobs are based on a 15% estimate of the total jobs in the sector. So we, we absolutely accept that there's been huge impacts by the downturn, but we would also point a presiding officer uh, when he refers to the position in Scotland as a whole, to the fact that employment in Scotland is higher than the rest of the UK. And I think that that is in part because of the economic strategy pursued by the Scottish Government of focusing on innovation, internationalisation, uh, fairness and economic growth. And that is work which Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and SDI are delivering throughout Scotland day in, day out. So we are absolutely not complacent. I have already outlined the main planks of work that have been achieved by Lena Wilson and the industry working together. Uh, but on the wider Scottish stage, our enterprise agencies and ourselves have, I believe, stepped up to the challenges facing the Scottish economy. And the downturn on the oil price is uh, one of the major ones. And we have done so in a way that has been both appropriate as well as effective. Mr. Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement? Uh, when I learned yesterday that the statement had been scheduled, I wondered why it was being made, and I really expected that the Scottish Government would have something new to tell us. But having listened to the Minister, I am none the wiser. Presiding Officer, the UK Government has taken steps to help the oil and gas industry with substantial tax changes, which have been warmly welcomed by the sector and are already showing dividends. Rather than complain about our other government, why can't the Minister tell us what new steps he will take to support jobs in the industry and the supply chain? And secondly, Scotland's Conservative MEP Ian Duncan has raised in the European Parliament concerns about the impact of a new EU Commission planning brief on hydrocarbons exploration and production, which could add extra costs to the industry and is causing concern. Does the Scottish Government share these concerns? And if so, what action is it taking? Minister. Uh, well, for, first of all, uh, I'm well aware of the, uh, the request by the EU for not a brief, but a BREF, B-R-E-F. Um, and I've already written to the UK Government indicating uh, that we do not believe that the case has been made out for the necessity for that. Uh, to respond to the main thrust of the remarks, uh, why are we here today? Well, presenting officer, we're here making a statement today substantially because the Labour Party requested that we make a statement. And I think it is appropriate that the government responds to reasonable requests made by opposition parties. It's called democracy and accountability. So that's why I'm here today. But he's entirely wrong when he said that we had nothing new to say. 
because if he had listened more carefully to the statement, he would have uh, heard that uh, I've referred very clearly indeed to the need for the UK government when it is uh, a, a amending its legislation on MER UK to ensure that as part of that, there is, as I outlined in the statement, an explicit pledge on the part of the UK government uh, to use fiscal levers to do that. Now, if they don't, then I would suggest that Murdo Fraser should have a very good read at uh, Serene Wood's report uh, on MER UK, because he points out that if we do not take action to prevent premature cessation of production, especially in production hubs, the consequences for the UK checker could be absolutely catastrophic. Serene outlined the price as an additional £200 billion, admittedly at last year's prices. Uh, but equally, the penalty is exactly the same amount unless the UK government rise to the challenge. So I think uh, Murdo Fraser, being an intelligent sort of guy, once he has the opportunity to reread my statement, will see that there is a very important and new reasonable call on the UK government to work with us to maximise the economic recovery and thereby do the very best possible thing to preserve and protect the supply chain and jobs in the oil and gas sector. Thank you. Can I point out to members that we are extremely tight for time all afternoon, so I would appreciate it very much if we have short answers and uh, short questions and short answers. So, Mark McDonald, followed by Sarah Boyd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the oil and gas industry is supported by a significant supply chain, which includes many small and medium-sized companies. Um, can the Minister outline what support Scottish Government is able to give those businesses to enable them to take advantages of opportunities outside of Scotland to support the industry uh, across the world? Minister. Uh, Mr McDonald is exactly right. And, uh, Really, the, the uh, backbone of the oil and gas industry is uh, uh, several hundred SMEs that uh, are providing um, cutting-edge uh, engineering, uh, drilling, subsea solutions worldwide. And I've had the opportunity to see that at three visits to Houston, to Norway, and elsewhere. And uh, the industry in Scotland is hugely respected, as Mark MacDonald knows. The Scottish Enterprise and SDI and HIE help these businesses in a number of ways. First of all, they help them internationalise. Secondly, they help them through access to Global Scots. 100 interviews were conducted by Global Scots during my last visit to Houston, mostly with SMEs. Thirdly, they provide an account management system, uh, which most SMEs that I have spoken to in the oil and gas industry cannot praise highly enough in helping open doors, access markets, and ascertain how to learn from others not to make mistakes in doing business in new locations. So SE, SDI, and HIE are playing a blinder in the work they do, the very practical work that they do for SMEs, and long may it continue. Sarah Boyant, followed by Chick Brodie. Given the importance of skills for the future of the industry, have any apprenticeships been lost in the industry and the wider supply chain? How many apprenticeships is the Scottish Government directly supporting? And what assessment has been carried out of the risk to the future of apprenticeships? And what plans does the Scottish Government have to ensure we have sufficient apprenticeships across the industry and the supply industries? Minister. Um, well, it's an extremely important question, and we absolutely share the members' uh, sentiments on this. Uh, we have uh, enhanced an, the Adopt an Apprenticeship Scheme, which was launched by SDS on the 16th of February. I can tell Sarah Boyack that of the 22 apprentices unfortunately made redundant, 17 have already secured alternative employment, 12 of these supported through the Adopt an Apprentice Scheme, and SDS is continuing to support the remaining five. The First Minister outlined when she, when she announced that the task force uh, was to carry out this work that our absolute priority is to help apprentices. After all, I think there's few things more callous than the laying off of an apprentice whilst he or she is undertaking his training. And to be fair to the industry, despite the difficulties, uh, almost every single business that I've met has uh, expressed the view that these sentiments expressed by the First Minister are absolutely correct. Chick Brodie, followed by Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what update it has received 
of the potential production figures for the significant Clare Ridge oil field west of Shetland, and also what <coughs> interim report it has received, if any, with regard to the current geological exercise re exploration on further potential oil finds off the west coast of Scotland and the Atlantic margins. Minister. Uh, the Clare uh, project is one of the largest ever in Scotland. Um, it is a, a giant field. It uh, is, according to BP, likely to continue in production until 2055. That's 40 years hence. Uh, it's also located in a region, presiding officer, where there are a great many other fields. Uh, so that particular project is a terrific success story. And I think it should also be remarked upon that its excellence relates to the high level of technological skill that is being brought to bear in this particular project. That is a feature of a great number of the new projects. Uh, his second question, uh, we are of course mindful of the opportunities of new discoveries around our shores uh, and Chick Brodie has made a bit of a campaign uh, of uh, ensuring that we do not neglect to examine whatever opportunities there may be in the west coast uh, and perhaps through his industry there were recently a group of uh, leading academic experts in geology who visited Scotland and with whom I engaged in dynamic earth across the road specifically to look at west coast opportunities and we are, I believe, having a, a a, an event or forum in which these can be taken further forward. A, nobody thought 60 years ago there was any oil around our shores at all, how wrong they were. Uh, and therefore, there may well, well be a substantial new discoveries on the west coast of Scotland. Liam MacArthur, followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Minister for advance sight uh, of his statement? Does Mr Ewing accept that consistent lower oil prices at levels below uh, production costs in the North Sea put the long-term viability of oil fields, pipelines and processing at risk? And would he therefore acknowledge the need for the industry, both governments and the OG, uh, OGA, to redouble efforts to find a range of creative solutions that extend the lifetime of the UK continental shelf and protect the thousands of, of jobs in the industry and the supply chain, including very many at Sulemvo in Shetland uh, and at Flotta in my own Orkney constituency? Minister. Uh, yes, I think uh, I, I would agree with the sentiment expressed by, by Liam MacArthur. Uh, we, we cannot control the oil price, nor can the UK government. Bob Keeler wrote a piece in the P&J recently uh, saying he can't control the oil price, nor predict what it's going to be. Uh, what industry can do and what they are doing is uh, adapting to the challenges, reducing costs, but also moving beyond that into attitudinal change uh, as to how to get the best. One example of one operator that has increased wrench time uh, by 30-40% offshore by listening to its workforce as to how best to organise matters offshore. I think that's a good practical example uh, and it's imperative that if the price is to stay uh, around the current level that the industry responds to that change. The impression I got in Aberdeen, uh, Ms MacArthur, was that it is indeed responding to that change and it's viewing matters positively, although there are very serious challenges still in the next uh, year or so ahead. Dennis Robertson, followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister in your statement uh, mentioned the work of the Energy Jobs Task Force. I wonder if the Minister could expand on the, uh, the statement in terms of the work that they're currently doing and the work that they expect to do uh, in the near future. Minister. Um, yes, I, I, I can. The, the task force has met uh, monthly since it was formed, chaired by Dr. Lena Wilson. It's reached out to um, a, a huge number of people within the industry. The report which I alluded to, which will be published shortly, will highlight case studies of people that have found jobs as a direct result of the work that it's done. But it's also looking at balanced messaging because it's necessary to, to uh, promote, as Mr. Robertson most certainly does, the truth that this is an industry that has got a very successful <coughs> future ahead of it, as well as an extremely successful past. And therefore, the task force uh, is aiming to do that as well, as indeed do I in the, these statements. Jackie Bailey, followed by Christian Allard. 
We join with the Scottish Government in supporting further tax incentives for the industry, but has the Minister done any analysis of cost and will he publish this? Because given that the tax revenue from oil is at an all-time low, much less than was assumed by the SNP in their white paper, will the Minister tell us how much tax he is prepared to forego to help the industry? Minister. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to hear that the official Labour position is that we should recognise the reduction of costs as a requirement for the oil and gas industry. Uh, I was in a state of uh, not entire certainty in, in the light of the um, election of their new leader at the weekend, who previously has, I believe, expressed views that the industry should be nationalised. Uh, were there to be any mention of that, then the future of the E&P companies, which is challenged at the moment, would be, would be dire indeed. Uh, it would be dire indeed. What I can say regarding cost of tax measures is this, uh, that uh, the uh, expiration tax credit system which Norway brought in uh, uh, and which led to the discovery of the 1.8 billion barrel Johan Sverdrup field has actually, although it pays in effect for 78% of the cost of expiration, uh, brought in several billion pounds extra. In other words, the right tax regime doesn't cost it brings in revenue, and that's why Norway, presiding officer, has got an oil and gas fund uh, which is in excess of £500 billion, whilst the UK uh, has got an oil fund of zero. Christian Allard, followed by Patrick Harvey. I thank the Minister for the statement, and as I was as well at Offshore Europe last week, uh, and I'm quite happy to, to report that there were a lot of new things happening in the industry. I will ask to ask the Minister if he agrees that the oil and gas workforce is very much getting younger, and now uh, a lot more women are in senior positions, and that all at Offshore Europe are becoming confident that the industry will come out of the present challenges leaner, more resilient, and more diverse than ever before. Minister. Hey. Yes, I, I, I have been very keen to try to uh, uh, promote in every possible way gender equality within the oil and gas industry and have attended many events uh, uh, with that purpose in mind. And there is an organisation of females who work within the oil and gas industry. Of course, only a relatively small minority of the jobs are actually offshore. Uh, uh, but, of course, females work offshore and do the job just as well. So I am very pleased to have the opportunity to... Uh, restate that, uh, and uh, 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 we will continue to press for progress. After all, some say that the oil and gas industry do continue to neglect around about one half of the population far too often. Patrick Carvey, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you. I'm grateful for the advanced copy of the statement and unsurprised that it contains no hint of recognition of the downsides of the fossil fuel industry, either the environmental destruction it's driving or the economic vulnerability that comes from our over-reliance on an unsustainable industry. But honestly, how can the Minister come to Parliament with a statement titled Future Prosperity for the North Sea and have literally not one word to say about the transition to marine renewables which can generate prosperity without destroying the life support system we all depend upon. Minister. Uh, well, because this statement is about the oil and gas industry, but if Mr Harvey cares to come along this evening or on Thursday, then he can hear me talk about the renewables industry. Uh, I know that Mr Harvey is very passionate about uh, fossil fuels and we know his position. Uh, I must admit I was surprised to see that there did seem to be some difference of opinion within the, the Green Party when I read that Mr Robin Harper apparently thinks there are circumstances in which uh, hydraulic fracturing would be a good idea. Uh, good, so uh, whilst we see a, a moratorium on hydraulic fracturing in Scotland, we, we see actual political fracturing within the Green Party. Claudia Beamish, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And planning for the future, surely it is important today that the Minister gives details of how the Scottish Government is specifically working to support the development of transferable skills for marine renewables for, for wind turbines when the oil rigs also do finally get decommissioned to ensure that these opportunities go to Scottish workers. I believe that we should be seeing a plan now. Minister. Well, I think we recognise that workers, whether from Scotland or other parts of the world, are, are kind of welcome to play a part, although obviously our efforts are on people who live in, in Scotland, and that's the, the objective to which our, our efforts are primarily devoted. Um, with regard to the offshore wind industry, of course we support this. 
Of course we support this, and we have uh, left no stone unturned in doing so. And we hope that uh, Beatrice, Morrow, Inchcape, Seagreen, uh, and Nerton agree will go ahead. But sadly, presiding officer, the power on that rests entirely with the UK government. Uh, and instead of seeing progress with the EMR, the, the, the announcement of the second round of strike prices, instead of seeing an energy policy which goes beyond 220, what we have seen is dithering, delay, prevarication, and what appears to be an out-and-out -out attack on renewables by the UK government. The Minister, in his statement, talked about maximising economic recovery. Can he tell us uh, what expectations he has that we may see a UK policy on that subject any time soon, and how is he going to help them? Minister. Well, I, I hesitate to speak for the, the UK government. I'm not sure that I would be their anointed spokesperson. Uh, however, it's abundantly clear from anyone who has studied the uh, uh, Serene Woods final report, here it is, I have it here, and I reread parts of it in the last couple of days, that there's one fundamental truth that has not been acknowledged by the UK government, and that is this, that if we are to achieve the objective of maximising economic recovery, that means that the UK government must step up to its role of using fiscal policy as a lever, nay, a precision tool to get the maximum from the North Sea. It must therefore make a commitment in the energy bill or the infrastructure bill which are going through the UK Parliament at the current time to do that. Now, they haven't done so yet, presiding officer, but I hope that uh, after this statement, they will begin to think very seriously because if they don't collaborate, why should they expect industry to collaborate? That is what they're asking. So we will be pursuing this argument uh, vigorously in Westminster with our MPs uh, and here in Scotland so that we do achieve the best for the industry and thereby secure uh, tens of thousands of jobs in this country. Thank you. Uh, that ends the statement by Freddie Shewing on future prosperity for the North Sea. My apologies to two members. I simply couldn't call. But we need to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14245 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on responding to global...